Um, I'm Jonathan Noble. I'm actually an Anglican priest. The school I'm working in is actually St. Francis Xavier College at Hamilton in Newcastle, which is actually a Catholic school. So it's quite unusual to have an Anglican priest as a religious studies coordinator in a Catholic school. Now, that kind of cooperation between the churches, does anyone know what that's called? Ecumenism, that's right. Wonderful example. Nice to know I'm an example of it. Um, as we uh, also said, Mr. Feeney also said, we do have some difficulties with our technology. Uh, I do have a microphone, but that's just for the video recorder. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in here. So um, I will need to speak the best I can. And I do ask that you just uh, sit quietly, take your notes, be enthralled by the words of wisdom. I don't know if I can quite live up to that uh, expectation for Mr. Feeney. Um, but find hopefully a different approach to something that you've probably already done at this stage. By the way, St. Francis Xavier College is a large college. It's just year 11 and 12. And uh, I actually have 19 two-unit classes in year 11 and 16 two-unit classes in year 12. Not me personally, but my staff. So we have a lot of students doing um, HSC studies of religion, around about 400 in both year 11 and year 12. The others, of course, are one unit. Okay. Religion in Australia post-1945, I think most of you have probably studied that part of the course. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So I thought, what can I actually do with this that you haven't heard before? And I'm actually going to do, as you say, a personal reflection. Now, I'm a really old person. I turned 64 this year. In other words, religion in Australia since 1945, hey, I've lived it. So I'm going to share with you some of what I have discovered and learned over that period of time. This, of course, you've all seen before. I hope you're aware of the sacred text for this particular course. That's it right there. The syllabus. Have you all seen a copy of the syllabus? If you haven't, you better do so between now and uh, November. The other sacred text I could mention, of course, is this one, the Cambridge Studies of Religion textbook, which I have been fortunate enough to write with Dr. Chris Hartney, who is a lecturer at Sydney University. And you'll see copies of out, out there in the uh, Cambridge uh, display. They have actually sponsored me to be here today, so I hope you and they get their money's worth today in the next 30 minutes or so. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Religion in Australia, the outcomes, you know that, and of course you know we're looking firstly at contemporary uh, Aboriginal spiritualities, and then of course the changes that have happened in Australia since 1945. I'm not going to go through that with you. I am, but in a different way. Rather than go through the dot points, which I hope you've all gone through, I'm going to just reflect more along a timeline, which includes some parts of my life, ladies and gentlemen. I hope I don't bore you too much. Of course, in 1945, we find that things are changing in Australia. And by the way, that was before I was born, okay? We find that Australia is emerging, understanding something about Aboriginal spirituality that it hadn't done before. For many years, Aboriginal people were not recognised as people in Australia. And yet, after the Second World War, a number of Aboriginal men went and fought in the armies and women went to the Second World War. And there was a realisation that these people made a significant contribution to Australia. The government in Australia, of course, sought to protect Aboriginal people, which is, of course, a wonderful example of paternalism, where it basically was really controlling Aboriginal people. There was the exploitation of Aboriginal people. Within Australia, sectarianism, existed. Um, by the way, Compass, do you all watch Compass on Sunday nights at six o'clock when you've got nothing better to do? Marvellous example, just last Sunday, a program that looked at conscription, which is a wonderful illustration and example of um, sectarianism in Australia. And of course, Christianity was by far the dominant religious tradition and we had the white Australia policy in force in Australia. 1945 saw the end of the Second World War, which in many ways saw a realignment of our allegiance as a nation. We had been primarily part of the British Empire up until the end of the Second World War. 
Events like the Kokoda Trail had meant that we now looked away from England more to ourselves and more to the Pacific and to America as an ally. We of course recognise that we accepted in Australia many displaced people and that first great wave of immigration included people that were mainly white, people from Eastern Europe who were members of the Orthodox Church, which we really hadn't seen in Australia before, and of course a large number of Jewish people came to Australia as well. So we were changing as a country in 1945. In fact, in the 10 years since the First World, Second World War, about a million people came to Australia as immigrants. That meant significant changes. The Catholic Church had been primarily Irish up until that point. A wave of Southern Europeans, particularly Italian Catholics, came and brought changes to the church. We have the emergence of the Orthodox churches. And while Christianity continues as a dominant religious tradition, there are significant changes taking place. White Australia policy, the Immigration Restriction Act was still in force and we have the beginning of what we call the baby boomers. I'm one of them. People that were born in those uh, about 10, 15 years after the end of the Second World War. And uh, they're your grandparents these days, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to recommend to you that at some point in the next few weeks, you sit down with one of your grandparents and you talk to them about what happened during their lifetime in terms of religion in Australia. Now, that's probably not the usual sort of conversation you have with them, but you will find that a tremendously valuable experience, as I hope you'll learn from my experience over the last uh, 64 years. Of course, Australia still believed in the outback. It always has been a myth. Australia is one of the most urbanised countries in, in the world and yet we have so much interest in the outback in Australia. 1952, March, the 9th of March to be perfectly honest, was the birth of Jonathan Gordon Noble, which is of course me, a baby boomer. That's me on my first day at school. And a cute little kid, <laughs> how things change. I grew up in central western Queensland, Longreach, Springshaw, so that was in the outback. My father was a Presbyterian minister. And uh, I was aware of some of the changes that, that were happening in Australia, some of the issues, sectarianism. I didn't go into a Catholic church until I was about uh, 18 or 19 years of age. I really didn't mix much with people outside of my church youth group. Um, I was aware of migration. I was aware, of course, in every country town there was a Chinese restaurant and a Greek cafe. And that was about it in terms of migration and changes to Australia. But I wasn't aware at that point in time of the other significant things that were happening within Australia. I really wasn't aware of other religious traditions. I really wasn't aware, even though I was in outback Australia, of Aboriginal communities until much later in my life. But of course, there were significant changes that were happening. Um, we find that Aboriginal people get the vote in 1962 and of course in the referendum in 1967 they were counted as citizens. There were things like the Freedom Rides in the mid-60s. The Second Vatican Council was a tremendously important event, not only affecting Catholicism, but affecting the whole of the Christian Church. For the first time in Australia, Catholic Christians and Protestant Christians actually began to talk together and to share insights and understanding. And of course, there were changes in the Aboriginal community, particularly the Wave Hill strikes, where Aboriginal, protested, Aboriginal people protested to receive payments, more than just the basic payment for their work. So during these years, I had an emerging understanding of things that were starting to happen in Australia. Uh, when I was about 16, my father moved to, to Carnarvon in Western Australia. He was a pilot. He became a flying patrol padre with the Australian in their mission. You've all heard of John Flynn, I hope, Rural and Outback Ministry from last year. This person is Fred Mackay, and I had the pleasure of meeting Fred Mackay. He was a successor to John Flynn. Wonderful man. If you look at the copy of the Cambridge Studies of Religion textbook, I take every opportunity to plug at everyone, you'll find there's a little bit about him and his influence. 
When my father went to Carnarvon as an AAM padre, he went as a minister to a church that included Congregationalists, Methodists and Presbyterians. The Uniting Church had not formed as yet, but this was an example of churches working together. I was a member of the local Church of Christ youth group. I occasionally went along to the Anglican Church. So there was a sense that we were no longer just Christians in one particular denomination, but we were Christians as a whole. Ecumenism was starting. Of course, in that era, I was a great fan of the Beatles, as indeed many people still are. And you can see the Beatles sitting over there on the right-hand side with a man by the name of Maharishi Yoga. The Beatles travelled to India to study under the guru, Indian guru, a Hindu. And so as the 60s moved on, we find this understanding that there were not only other Christian denominations, but there were other religions as well. And for many of us, growing up at that time, that was a revelation that Christianity wasn't the only religion in the world, which meant, of course, we were then questioning our own faith, our beliefs, our commitment, and the role of these other religions. 1970, Jesus Christ Superstar. You've all heard of it, I hope? Yep, I've seen it a few times. But we in 1970, we would sit together and I can remember sitting in the local Anglican church listening to this record. Now record, that's a big round thing like that made of vinyl. You may have heard of them, okay? Um, And for the first time, I was confronted with Jesus Christ, the man. Now that may not be a big revelation to you, but to me it was. I had no trouble believing in Jesus was God. But here he was a man, which for me personally was a very, very significant event. And Jesus Christ Superstar meant that Jesus became popular in the modern media of the day. And there was a whole Jesus revolution and the Jesus people in the 70s. You know, a lot of other cool things were happening back in those days. Um, By the way, this is me. Back in the good old days. This is Marie. Marie was the love of my life. She really was. I was about 18 years of age, but there was one problem. Marie was Catholic. (laughs) Oh. Well. Hey, there was only one thing we could do. We broke up. Oh, I know. Because in those days, sectarianism was still very much part of the Australian community, especially as I was going away to study theology and become a minister of religion. I couldn't have a Catholic wife, could I? Of course, things are very different. By the way, I do now, but that's another question. Okay. (laughs) The other thing, of course, that was happening was that communications and travel were becoming accessible. When I was about 20 years of age, I flew over to, uh, to England just to visit, like many, many other people did at the start of that sort of rite of, of passage in many ways. Um, for many Australians, it became, became a part of way of life, something that you would do. And, and that was because of things like the jumbo jet, things like uh, satellite communication and so on. So these were changing times, changing times for all of us. And we became aware of so many different things we became aware that people didn't necessarily believe what we believed. We became aware that there were good people who were Buddhists or who were Hindu. We became aware that that there were bad people who were Christians. So we became aware of changes in our world that really for us in Australia had been a long, long way away from our thought and from our experiences. Of course, in the 1970s, we began to question those kind of traditional religious practices that we had. And Christianity, as you know from your census statistics, begins its decline in the 70s onwards. There was the establishment of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, and for many people, they were actually confronted with Aboriginality. By the way, one of the things that happened when I moved to Western Australia is that the local Church of Christ Church ran missions. You all heard of missions, haven't you? To do with Aboriginal spirituality. 
And so the first time I became aware of Aboriginal people around me, and I actually, I guess in many ways I didn't see them as different, but in one way they were. And uh, so for me at that age of what, 16 or 17, I became aware of the fact that there were these people who were forced to live on these reserves. We couldn't just go out and visit them. We couldn't just invite them over to our place. There was something different about them. And so we began to be aware of what was happening with Aboriginal people in Australia. Of course, in 1972, we had the election of the Labor government. For me, that personally was very significant. We had, of course, the process of conscription, as you may know, in the 1970s, where I had those little marbles that came out. My marble came out. I was all ready to go to Vietnam as a soldier, but uh, two years previously, I'd had an operation under my ankle, so I failed the medical. How distressing. Um, which meant I didn't have to go. But the Whitlam government, of course, um, abolished conscription and brought tremendous changes to Australia that's still affecting our community even now. Of course, in 1975, we had the dismissal, which I hope you know about. You know, well, may we say, God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General. Heard that before? I'm sure you have, okay. It was, of course, the end of the Vietnam War from Australia's perspective. It was, of course, the end of the white Australia policy. The Family Law Act had changed. There was a symbolic giving back of Aboriginal land, although it took many, many years to actually come to fruition, where Gough Whitlam um, poured the sand into the hand of Vincent uh, Linagari. Um, and of course, the uh, Racial Discrimination Act was introduced as well. And of course, with the end of that, with the changes that were taking place, there was the second, or actually the third wave of boat people that came to Australia. The third wave, I say, they were people from Southeast Asia. The second wave of boat people, of course, were the 10 pound migrants that came out after the end of the Second World War. The first wave of boat people that invaded Australia, of course, came in 1788. But we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in class elsewhere. Okay. So the boat people seem to be preoccupying our government today. Hey, it's just part of a long tradition. So why are we all so stressed about it? But that's enough politics, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. As I said, the 1970s was a rise of globalisation, especially travel. It was also the rise of new age spirituality. People were beginning to be disillusioned by the church and were looking for other religious alternatives. With the discovery of Eastern mysticism like Buddhism and Hinduism, there was a spirituality which was much more individually focused rather than institutionally focused. And that was part of the changing trends of the 1970s. And so new age spirituality begins to emerge, you know, with crystals and all that kind of stuff. And uh, looking back to paganism and uh, the influence of yoga, meditation, karma, those kind of concepts are starting to emerge within our language of people today. In 1977, the most significant act of ecumenism took place. It was the formation of the United Church of Australia uh, on the 22nd of June. It's probably the one date in Australia, I suggest most of you remember at some point in time. And of course, the emergence of not only of other religious groups, but also the emergence of those people in Australia who finally said, I don't believe in anything. I have no religion. And as you know, that's risen quite dramatically since then. Prior to 1945, if you had no religion, you're obviously a wicked, evil person. The realisation came in the 1970s that, hey, you didn't necessarily believe in anything, but didn't make you bad or wicked or evil or anything. It was just what you believed. So we find the rise in the trend of the no religion category in the census. Now, I began work, first of all, when I finished school, just between you and me, I did really badly in my HSC, okay? My parents actually gave me my report cards just a couple of years ago. I couldn't believe it. If my kids brought them home, I would have killed them. Anyway, so there is life after school, believe me. So I went out to work. I worked for three years at the uh, Carnarvon Space Tracking Station during the Apollo and Skylab missions. They were exciting days, I must say. 
And then I decided after three years work, then I was beginning to uh, want to go back to university. I went and studied theology in Perth and then decided that I would go to uh, Sydney to study. That's a photo of me and my car, my Mini Minor. I drove across the Nullarbor to study theology at, at uh, Moore College. A bit more hair on me in those days as well. Okay. Um, I then became an Anglican. I left the Uniting Church around the time of church union, became an Anglican and studied for the Anglican priesthood. Married two lovely children, worked firstly in social welfare uh, in Surrey Hills among homeless and alcoholic men, which was very interesting. And then I became a priest. And I was too aware of the changes in the Australian community of how people were finding that the church was not necessarily going to be there for them to answer the questions they have. The people are much more concerned about their own answers rather than the institution and that people really needed to find something that was going to actually address the needs and concerns in their life and that wasn't necessarily going to be in your local Anglican, Presbyterian or Catholic parish. Changes were underway in Australia. In the 1980s, of course, some freehold title was given to Aboriginal people. We find also that uh, Parliament in 1988, when it opened the new Parliament House, for the first time, I think, and I'm not certain about this, held a multi-faith service. This was not just an ecumenical service, this was an interfaith service. Recognition of the different religious traditions which are part of life in Australia. We find also, of course, that in the 1980s, the growth of Pentecostalism as a significant group within Australian Christianity and the growth of the mega churches, the Hillsong churches, Christian city churches and so on. And uh, it's become, as I said, the se uh, well, fastest growing group within Christianity in Australia. And of course, new age spirituality has moved from being lunatic fringe to becoming mainstream. It wasn't just the tree huggers in Nimbin that were new age spiritual people. It was your local business guys that were doing uh, your human potential courses and so on. And that people in, that you would meet with each day had some of these new concepts as part of their lifestyle. They would practice meditation. They would practice yoga. They believed in things like karma and reincarnation. And they all weren't wackos like most of the early new ages. They were well, normal, ordinary people. So new age spirituality becomes part of Australian mainstream life and society. Of course, I then, as I uh, continued my work, I served in country churches and also in churches in Sydney. I actually lectured at a place called Bimberdeen in Cootamundra as a uh, lecturer for the Aboriginal Evangelical Fellowship. Now, Bimberdeen had begun its life as a home for girls who were Aboriginal girls. It was definitely part of the protectionism that was the government policy in the early part of the 20th century. Now it had been given back to the Aboriginal community and it was being used to train Aboriginal pastors and people within that community. I became, of course, very much aware of Pentecost Pentecostalism and the New Age movement. Hey, I discovered that I was actually accepting some of these New Age beliefs for myself, heaven forbid. And in my parish in Sydney, a lot of the kids, young people in the parish were going off to Pentecostal churches. So we had to come to terms with that and how that affected our life in the parish. Um, and at, uh, I was actually at Castle Cove in Sydney at that stage. We had a very, very strong fellowship group, which was actually probably quite unusual for the 1980s. And of course, I too had a growing family. I now have two beautiful children one of whom's working in Thailand with the Department of Immigration. He's married. The other one is a GP now, so she must have got some brains from somewhere, and uh, working in Newcastle. And I've become a grandfather for the first time last year. Oh, is that sweet? Thank you. <laughs> but hey, I'm too young to be a grandfather. I'm only 18, aren't I? Mm, okay. All right, 1990s. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> of course, the Mabo decision, very, very significant, very important. My father, incidentally, who's still alive, he's 90, and he's probably healthier than I am, quite frankly. But he and I do not talk politics. He lives in Queensland. 
He moved to King of Roy in Queensland so he could be close to Job Jelke Peterson, for all the people who know the significance of that. He believes to this day that the stolen generation was a good thing. And uh, he believes that by taking children away from Aboriginal communities, we did it for their benefit. He believes that things like the Mabo decision were a retrograde step. And so obviously we don't talk politics. But of course, it was very significant for the Aboriginal community. Native Title Act, of course, in 1993. There's a fascinating Four Corners program, I think it is, on the introduction of the Mabo, of the Native Title Act. And Paul Keating, who was very much responsible for it, talks through the implications and they interview the main people involved. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see that, you'll find it really, really fascinating. Um, maybe that's just me. And then, of course, the WIC decision, which talked about the uh, fact that freehold and native title could st still exist, at uh, leasehold rather, um, and of course, the bringing them home report, which was heartbreaking. It really was. And I can remember seeing some of the people who spoke about that bringing home the report and the effect of the stolen generation on their families. And uh, sitting there watching the television as people shared the stories, you could just share that sense of tragedy and loss and grief that came across. Well-meaning. My father's a good man. He believes very strongly that he was helping the community and he can't see the fact that so many people were hurt. And that's been one of the difficulties we've had in Australia, isn't it? We always want to do good, but it doesn't always turn out that way. In fact, I guess that's the story of our lives, isn't it? 1998, of course, the sorry day and the fact that the parliament expressed regret, not an apology, for what had happened to the Aboriginal people. Ecumenism was growing, okay? I had swapped quite readily when I look back at my life, brought up as a Presbyterian, gone to the uh, Anglican church, been part of a Church of Christ youth group, mixing freely and happily with people of the Uniting Church and Pentecostal churches. Lost my Gothic girlfriend, I hadn't quite gone that far yet. But we were actually finding that Christians were working together. The formation of the uh, National Council of Churches of Australia. And of course, as years have gone, I've had the great pleasure of working with other people across different religious groups. And uh, it really has been a pleasure. Um, I've spoken quite a uh, lot with uh, Hindu people. It's probably my speciality in some ways. I uh, work with Muslim people, planning conferences, with Jewish people, with Buddhist people. And you know what? They're just like we are. They believe the same, similar things, not the same, similar things. We have a great deal in common. They are ordinary, wonderful people, just like each of us. And we are all on our quest for truth, for religious allegiance, to worship God, whatever. Different understanding. I wouldn't go as far as to say we're all on the same path, but that's a, that's a different story. But of course, we do communicate and talk well together. And I hope that's one of the things you'll pick up from your workshops today, looking at other religious traditions. Of course, in 2000, we had the, the Olympic Games in Sydney. Two years later, of course, the Bali bombing. We participated in the Iraq war, the Redfern riots, the Cronulla riots. And of course, what we find in recent times, and you only have to look at the media these days to see the increasing tension that's coming into Australia between um, the Australian community and particularly Muslim people. Very much, I think, can be laid at the door of the media as much as anything, but that's just a personal reflection. We have increasing migration in Australia from non-Christian regions. Tremendous growth in Buddhism, second largest religious tradition in Australia. Of course, the largest religious tradition is Christianity, 61.1% or something. Buddhism, the second largest religion in Australia. Does anyone know what percentage? About 2.5, it's not big. The fastest growing religious tradition in Australia is Hinduism. Largely through migration, of course, as you understand. And Judaism, important and significant in Australia, but largely a similar percentage uh, across the years. The no religious tradition, uh, uh, category in the census, of course, has risen dramatically. It's about 28%, I think, now in Australia. So over a quarter of people in Australia say they have no religion. Um, 
That's just a fact of modern life in Australia. And to be perfectly frank, I'm sure there's some of you here, aren't there? Anyway, but no, you're all good Catholics, aren't you? Okay. And then, of course, in 2008, and I think you're still young enough to remember this, are you? Kevin Rudd made the apology. Just about every school I know of, everyone sat in front of the telly and watched him make the apology, which was a tremendously significant and moving event. And then, of course, in 2008, Pope Benedict came. All right. So, in my own personal journey, I moved from parish ministry to school chaplaincy to basically becoming a teacher, religious studies coordinator. Over those years, for me, I've moderated my position. When I went to theological college, I believed that the Presbyterian church was the only true church, that Christianity was the only true religion, and very rigid, dogmatic, right wing. I have changed. I now recognise the importance of different religious traditions working together and the importance of different Christian denominations working together. Being chairman of the Association for Studies of Religion, uh, HSC marker and so on, HSC judge, and I really must admit in these last few years, I've really enjoyed my time as a teacher and uh, have begun, as you heard, writing textbooks as well. So the last census that we held in Australia, well, by the way, we'll be having another one this year. In the last census, we noticed that Hinduism was the fastest growing religion. Buddhism, the second largest religion. The second largest category is the no religion category. And of course, Christianity is the largest religious tradition. We have in Australia continued hostility towards boat people. You only have to listen to the news in the last two days to realise what's going on here with the potential closing of, of uh, Manus Island. And uh, basically all sides of government saying this is not a victory to those who organise boat people. And then of course we find within Australia we have on one hand uh, greater efforts towards interfaith dialogue but on the other hand a growing uh, anti-Muslim sentiment in Australia as well. Confidence in the church has been undermined, particularly through recent inquiries regarding sexual abuse. And uh, there's undermined not only the church, of course, but other community organisations. One of the things that I've noticed in my lifetime is not only the decline in attendance and adherence to the Christian churches, but it also relates to other similar organisations. Boy Scouts, YMCA, Rotary. We are no longer a group of people that are concerned about our community as a whole, but about ourselves. So we have this increased emphasis on individualism. When I first started going to church many, many years ago, I was part of a community. And my thinking in many ways was, how can I contribute to this community? Today, our thinking is, how can this community or whatever be significant for me? We have this reversal that's taking place so that we now basically see uh, the rise of individualism and a uh, move from mainstream religion to new age spirituality and non-religion. We're moving beyond the traditional religious borders. Um, we're recognising, of course, that reconciliation should be part of everyday life and, of course, the role of technology when it works is great. So in reflection, there's me with the sacred text, of course. Fascination, I do have a fascination with changes to Australia's religious landscape and I do ask the question, what is the future of religion in Australia? <coughs> we need to integrate different kinds and different aspects of spirituality. Do we move to reassert traditional beliefs? What is going to be the role of Pope Francis, which I think is a lot more significant than many people think? And how do we cope with a modern change? So let's go back, look at our syllabus. I think I've covered some of those key points there. I'm not going to labour the point. And just remember, plenty of resources. By the way, if you have not yet seen the documentary called The Australian Soul, I recommend it very, very highly. And uh, as I said, talk to your parents. Talk to your grandparents and ask them what they can reflect on religion in Australia post-1945. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.